So before going to give some quick overview on the JDK nine, uh, uh, how many of you have tried the the early access releases that which you can download? Have you tried? Few of you have tried that. I mean, it's available there from the Java.net site, uh, which you can download and try. Try your existing applications and see if that runs the, those run as is without any changes. For the most part, most of your applications should run with the JDK 9 early access. If something is seriously broken, I think you must. Uh, it would be nice if you can send the email to appropriate open JDK list saying that you know this such and such thing is broken and it's running fine in JDK 8. So that's one thing that you may want to do with your existing applications and also to not to understand the main thing the modules in JDK 9 there's a nice document called state of the module system. This is a document this is a living document written by Mark Reynolds. This is maintained uh, as as, as in the project evolves this document is being updated. As things you know, this document is being updated. This is the document that the overview of the main main pieces of Jigsaw. So this is the this is the document. If you just Google for state of the module system, you should get this document. There's some simple hello world example as well as you know it explains what are we trying to do in JDK9. So the main thing that we are doing to add in JDK9 is modules. You know, you have this code organization. You have Code organization principles in JDK 8 is you have these classes, and on top of classes, you have packages. Uh, and then, of course, for runtime deployment, you have jar files. So, in between packages, uh, after, beyond packages, we have we have added modules. You know, modules, a bunch of packages in which you expose certain packages to other modules, and you hide certain packages from other modules. So, essentially, a package is a bunch of packages. Uh, a module is a bunch of packages. In which few packages are exported, and the rest of the packages are internal details of your module. Uh, and also, your module can explicitly say that module A depends on module B and C. So, module A can say it requires module B and C. Uh, so, when, when JDK starts your module A, it checks that there is already a module B and module C that are available there. If it's not there, it's going to give you right, right away that there are dependencies. Not satisfied, and therefore I'm exiting. So I'm going to continue, and then you will get a no class def found error at the nth minute. If in the previous releases, if class A uses class B, and you know they start with class A's main, it starts running, and then it tries to hit the class B, you get a no class def found error. That's what we try to avoid in module system. Module A says that module A requires module B and module C. So when module A is loaded loaded to be run, then it checks, okay, there's B and C needed, then B and C are not available, it's going to say that, you know, the dependencies are not satisfied and will come out. So that's the jigs of what's, what's being done. So JDK's own code is organized as a bunch of modules. If you see the, the, the latest code repo, uh, you will see that uh, JDK's own code is organized as a bunch of modules, like java.rmi, java.scripting, JDK.jar tool, even, even, even the JDK pin tools, each of the pin tools are part of some uh, some some module. So you see all these are uh, uh, JDK's own code is always as well as modules. Uh, and what is the other main changes that you will see JDK 8 versus JDK 9? So this is your typical JDK 8 installation. You will find uh, the JRE directory under that, and find the list directory under that. You will see the rt.jar. The rt.jar is the place from which the bootstrap loader loads the classes. And then, of course, then you will see uh, the uh, extension library. You know, extension library, extension loader loads classes from the with ext directly. a bunch of other jar files. These are the jar files which uh, the extension loader will load classes from. And then, of course, you have. Tools.jar. Tools.jar is the tools.jar is a jar file from which uh, the JDK bin tools uh, classes will be loaded. This is how your uh, JDK 8 installation looks like. If you look at the JDK 9 build, as I'm going to show you JDK 9 build, if you see that this is much simpler organization, 
you don't see any jrdk there is no jre directory this was separate jre jdk all that is gone all you see is a lib lib folder and then there is a bin folder under the lib folder you see a huge file called modules you see this huge file called modules it's a pretty big file and that file is the only file that you find you don't find any other jar files you know uh, there is no jre there is no jre lib ext there is no tools jar there is not no other jar there is only one jar that is jrt hyphen fs jar jar i'll come back to that jar later later all the platform classes jdk platform classes are located in this modules file and that's the only file that you find there are no other jar files goodbye jar files for the platform classes this particular file the modules file is not a jar file it's not a jar file it's it uses a proprietary format a jar file as you might know jar file is just a zip file few header stuff that's nothing more than a zip file so there are no jar files in jdk 9 of the of the platform I mean, of course you can still use your application as much jar files there are no jar files the modules file itself is is of the file format called j image this is a proprietary file so in the previous releases if you want to know the classes that are there in jd rt jar or tools jar or any of the extension libraries of course you can use the jar tool and you can say jar tbf you know just list all the files uh, list all the class class entries in that in, in the jar files since this is a new file format uh, there is a new tool called j image new tool called j image the image uh, can list uh, and extract uh, files from the j image file the image file that i mentioned j image is the tool to visual, visualize that uh, visualize the file as well as extra extract the file so if you want to extract rt jar you would have you done jar slash xdf and rt jar now you you say j image list the contents of j image the j image file is here This is going to list all the classes and properties and other stuff that are found in the uh, platform image platform modules file. Because there is only one single modules file, the modules file has got enough information. This class has to be loaded by Bootstrap. This has this has to be loaded by extension loader. This has to be loaded as a as a tool uh, tool class and so on. All that information is all available in one big J image file. There are no more jar files. That's the first takeaway. Now, how is it going to affect me? probably not if you are using if you are deploying your application as a jar file you execute it it's going to now run as is without any changes but if you are going to do, deal with classes in the bootstrap or classes in the extension jar files in the past if you have done things like you know a dash x bootstrap boot class path and prefix the boot class path with some some other directory or append the boot class path with some some directories or if, if you have used this dash d java extension directories and Point to your own extension jar directories. All that is not going to work. All that is gone. So there is no boot class path. There is no uh, there is no extension jar directories. None of that is going to work in JDK uh, nine because all the platform classes are going to come from this J image file. And uh, J image file itself can be visualized using this J image tool. And if you want to extract uh, stuff from J image uh, file, you can use this extract option and uh, and extract. The contents of the system modules file under directly just for inspecting and uh, you know playing with the uh, class files. So that is um, the first. Uh, just one sec. Uh, there. Yes. Uh, so that I'm just. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll yell just so you can hear me. Um, if anyone's got any questions, Sundar's also happy to, to pause. And so we've got some wireless mics. We can run around. So just keep your hand up, and um, we can pause in. Um, and uh, Sundar, if you can just keep the command window up so we can see what you're talking about as well. There is a slight um, uh, delay from what, what, what you see on your screen to what we saw on ours by a couple of seconds. So if you just keep the, um, keep the command prompt up uh, on your screen, then we can, um, then we can at least uh, see what you're saying that you're talking about as well. Um, okay. So, Yeah, um, I've got a question for you. Just um, with the um, the module file, how big is that roughly? Um, I saw the byte count, but what's that? What's that roughly uh, in megabytes or? or um... Uh, 
that's something like 121 meg. 131. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 But uh, this one includes the you know the entire content. So it's not just rt.jar. It includes the all the extension libraries. It includes the tools.jar. Uh, as I mentioned, there is no difference between JRE and JDK anymore. Yeah. You, okay. You, yeah. So depending on uh, you, you can you can subset that. That's what we will be shortly seeing. So this is a pretty big file. Uh, so, um, so where does it come from? Where does it, where does the contents of this image file, uh, the J image file, come from? The J image file is assembled from a bunch of what we call modular jar files. Is what, what do you mean by modular jar files? Under JDK, you will find this directory. Under, uh, under JDK, there is a file uh, folder called J mods. Under the J mods you will find a dot jmod file, one for each of the modules that is bundled in JDK. You see this java.activation.jmod, java.basejmod, and so on. The jmod files, we call them modular jar files. What do we mean modular jar files? The modular jar file has got everything that is needed to go into a module. It's not a, it's not a typical jar file in the sense that it includes class files, as well as it also includes native code associated with that particular uh, module. For example, if you, if you uh, these are these are as I said, these these are jar files basically with some specific directories in that. So you can use typical uh, your usual jar tool itself to to inspect the contents of a particular JMod file. Uh, so for example, if I want to look at the Java dot basis JMod file. Uh, I find this directory is called native directory. Under the native directory, you'll see DLLs. You'll see DLLs uh, uh, that are needed for that particular module. In this case, this is the java.base module, which is the base module for the JDK platform. You see this conf directory where there's a bunch of properties files and policies and other stuff that are need associated with this module are, are stored. Then you have directly, then you see this java.exe, java.w.exe. These are the executable files associated with this module. And then, of course, this classes directory. Under the classes directory, you have the packages directory and then class files. So a jmod file is complete in every respect. You know, jmod files contain, if you if you are given a particular jmod file of a module, you've got everything that are associated with that particular module. So are we going to use this in running? No, JVM is not going to look at any of the JMod files. JVM will only load the file, uh, class files from the modules file. It never touches the JMod file. Then why do we ship the JMod's file, JDK? We ship the JMod's file so that you as a developer can decide to subset the JDK or JRE. You know, you can create your own JRE, I mean, reduced version of JDK, JRE, whatever you call. And uh, where you can you can say I want to include only these these platform modules. So, you know, for example, I'm never going to use Corba. I'm never going to use RMI. Uh, I'm never going to use these these things. So I want to shed all the loads. I just want to create a new fresh JDK with lot less modules in it. And um, probably I have figured out these are the only modules needed for running my applications. And, and therefore, I want to create a fresh JDK image, the entire JDK image that will only comprise those modules that I would actually use. So for that purpose, we need to provide every information of every module that is available in the system so that you can assemble at hand. You know, I, I can say that these, these modules are module A, B, C, D are the only modules that I need from the system. And I create a subset version of JRE out of those modules. So that is why these J mod files are shipped as part of JDK. But the J mod files are themselves never loaded by the operating system, never loaded by the JVM at all. Because as you see that, because it embeds DLLs, it embeds executables, it embeds class files, and so on. Obviously, this cannot be consumed by operating systems because operating systems don't load code from a, a within from uh, that are buried inside a zip file. You know, they don't load shared objects or executables that are buried inside the uh, the, the the zip file. So these JMod files are given as a development tools. Okay. Then there is also a tool called JMod. You will see the JMod. This JMod tool is, 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 can also do, do a list, uh, describe, create. Uh, this JMod tool is equivalent to JAR tool, uh, but it, it just manipulates the JMod uh, files. You know, JMod tools are nothing but JAR 
uh, jar tools that are, that are geared towards jmart files jmart tool can uh, can list the contents uh, it's just that it understands the uh, the directory structure of the of the particular uh, particular directory structure that is used in the in the jmart for example if i do a java.base.jmart that lists the content as i said jmarts are nothing but jar files so you could even use the jar tools uh, uh, but it's just that you know jmart understands the directory format better uh, and then it also has APIs to create a new jmart now so practically you would not as a developer you never deal with jmart tool nor you know create jmart uh, files you would be actually using the platform provided jmart files and creating your own fresh jdk why would you want to do that say for example if you are deploying your application on, uh, on cloud or say, say, say if you have your docker installation you want to say i don't want all these guys that i'm just sitting there and i'm got, never going to use in my application in that case you can create a fresh jdk uh, that is geared towards your application uh, maybe you are deploying it on raspberry pi i mean you have an iot platform you want to deploy it on raspberry pi uh, then you can say you know i just want java to come back one profile or maybe compact one plus few more modules and you know you can decide what goes into your version of jdk how do you do that there is a new tool called jdk there is a new tool, tool called jlink under the jdk directory this jlink tool uh, is 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 what we call a linker tool you know typically uh, you know if you use c compiler you compile your code and then you use ld or link to link the code to create executable java never had a linker tool because java always used dynamic linking you know load, it loaded classes and then the method is called the method refers to another class and then that class is not yet loaded java automatically loaded it from java files and other places directories and so on so we never had a linker as such but this jlink is a linker tool which takes a bunch of a bunch of modules system modules like jmods uh, or even user jmods and assembles a fresh jre geared towards that or towards that particular application in hand so i'm going to show you uh, how to use jlink on a simple uh, simple case where i'm going to use uh, the naso engine so i just say for example if i want to develop uh, scripting applications i don't need anything else that is not going to be used in java scripting uh, say i want to be uh, something that is compatible uh, comparable to say node js or va now i just want something like 3 4 mb is not 120 mb sub uh not the 120 mb sub lib modules i just want something like maybe 20 mb you know 20 mb to uh, 10 mb so how do i do that i use the jlink tool to accepts module path module path is the jmart script and okay. accepts uh, the output directly it tells me uh, it also accepts the start modules that i want to add you know i just want to add uh sorry i don't want anything else i mean i what i'm telling jlink is that hey jlink produce a fresh jdk under the directory foo and these are the jmod files directly uh, directly that contain jmod is is uh, dot slash lib slash jmod and uh, just start with jdk scripting naso module and uh, and chase all the transitive dependencies from that using jdk scripting naso as the start module chase the dependencies and create a fresh jre for me or jdk for me whatever you want to call so uh, so it says that the start of the module for the top let's see so i gave the wrong great meaning okay i think start one Jlink uh, has all the data that it needs, and, and it created a directory under the current directory. And as you see, that food directory has got a bin folder, comps folder, lib folder, and of course, I, I should see the modules file. You can see the size of the modules file is a lot lesser now. You know, it's got it's something like 23 MB. Yeah, not the Not the 120s or MB. It has got uh, 23 MBs, 
but this is a reduced version of JDK. It can run scripting applications, uh, not much. Okay. I, go to the um, I find lot less number of DLLs and, uh, and, and the executables. I find the JRAM script.exe, of course, that is that's a script shell, so that can run. And then, of course, I have this java.exe and the usual stuff and few DLLs. Not the entire stuff that you will find in a, in a JDK. Uh, this is my uh, reduced version of JDK. Reduced version of JDK, I, 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 I do, I, I inspect the file of release. The release file tells me what modules has, uh, have gone into this particular uh, uh, JDK. It says java.scripting module, jdk.dynalic, java.larming, JDK scripting naso, and java.base. That's all. Nothing else. You don't find java.rmi, for example, you don't find Compiler, you know, Java compiler, JDK Java C module. You don't find any of those things. Uh, and then it gives you a few more uh, metadata in the release file. But of course, uh, any application, so long as the application has dependencies only on these, these modules. If, if your application has dependencies only on these, these particular modules, uh, your application can run with this particular Java tool, the Java tool here. But if you use, say, for example, AWT or Swing or RMI, uh, and then try to deploy on this particular reduced JDK, obviously it's going to tell, you know, uh, uh, those modules, uh, you have dependency on those modules, and those modules are not found in this particular JDK, and therefore not going to run this. So, but if you, uh, uh, as it's very pretty clear that, you know, JLink gives you enough power to create. Uh, a reduced uh, JDK and also JLink uh, has a plugin model. It allows you to write your own plugins. JLink has got its own API and allows you to write your own plugins. You can do link time optimizations. So for example, if you are developing an in internationalized application, uh, uh, but you are targeting only particular locales, you know, uh, JDK comes with huge uh, locales you know, for, for so many other languages, but you know, my target is only. Uh, Particular uh, particular geos, and, or, or maybe I want to deploy, give a different JDK for different geos. You know, I don't want to give uh, home automation uh, Raspberry Pi JDK for Euro market. I don't want to ship the entire uh, Asian locales there. So the JDK, uh, the JLink has enough plugins for you to control. You know, I want these these uh, internationalization info to go into the uh, JDK and not anything else. So JDK. Uh, the, uh, JLink provides you enough uh, flexibility uh, to, to, to tell um, the stuff that you want to uh, put in the, the generated JDK. Um, for example, it can, uh, it can also, it also has things like compression, you know, in the, in the, in the previous JDK releases, RT.jar was never compressed and all the other system.jar uh, files were compressed. So for example, if you can say that, you know, I want to compress everything. Uh, there is an option for compress. Uh, there is a compress option in JLink. Uh, I'll just show you the compress option. Uh, you know, I can set the compress and, uh, and tell that you know what, what is the level of compression I want. So, compression itself is a particular built in plugin of the JLink. So, I set the compression and compression level to be two. Uh, now, the JLink will do everything that it did in my previous run, but it will also compress the, uh, the modules, you know, uh, and now now it's more like 11 MB, it was, it was 23 MB earlier, now you see 11 MB modules file. Uh, we, we started 100, 120 odd MB of modules file and went, we went down to 23 and we, have, we went down to 11. Uh, so, that, 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 that just tells you that how far you can reduce or uh, how much you want to include uh, in your, uh, in your uh, eventual JDK. And this is not just true for uh, system provided modules alone. If you develop your application as a modular application, if you have your own application developed as a bunch of JMODs, and JLink can use those JLink uh, JMOD files and link those things and apply the same compression filter, what are the filter that you are saying, I mean, for example, you can remove the debug information, you can choose to uh, leave the debug information for part of the classes and remove that for elsewhere, uh, you can remove the internationalization information, 
uh, you know, all that will be applicable for your mod modular jobs as well. And then eventually you create a customized uh, version of JDK, uh, which is which is optimized for running your applications. And obviously, uh, you, you you don't want to compress the whole the uh, whole whole of the system module files because you know there was a reason why RT.jar was never comp uh, compressed in the first place. But of course, Compass has uh, you know filters. You can say that the uh, apply these regex and only these uh, class names which satisfy these regex you compress and the rest you leave it as uncompressed. Maybe you can you can tune in, tune your application and say okay these these classes will be loaded anyway uh, are loaded always. I don't want to compress and, and the rest I want to compress and so on. So this gives you yeah. Hello. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> questions. Any questions so far? Yeah, thank you. So, um, oh, yeah, I'll say you. Hi. Can you expand more on how we would use uh, Jigsaw ourselves uh, as opposed to just shrinking the. Huh. Okay, uh, how would you use Jigsaw in your own code? Is that what is the question? Yeah, so how would I say I'm writing a library and I want to. Um, refer, I want my captive libraries that are certain versions, but I don't want to force those versions on my consumer. Those huh. uh, as you fancy class libraries. Can I do that kind of thing? Uh -huh. So the, the question is about how do I use uh, the Jigsaw in my own applications, okay? Uh, I would say to start with, you, the first step is to just to see whether you can run, run it as is without any changes. Uh, because you might see few things break, breaking because uh, because of the incompatibilities. Uh, there, of course, there is binary compatible, but then you will see few things that are previously exposed are not exposed anymore. So you may want to check it first, just deploy it as is and see if it runs. And then if it runs, then the next step would be to add module hyphen info dot Java files. Those are the descriptors saying that this is the new module I am developing. Name of the module. And say these these packages I want to export from my module, uh, and then you know the, once you add a modular descriptor module hyphen info dot Java file at the top level of your uh, source code, and then if you, if you use JDK 9's Java C, it knows that okay this is the new module and this module has only these these packages exported. So I'll show you a, an example module in one of the system module itself, and then you will see that you know this is how. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. The module uh, uh, info syntax. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the module info syntax. How? Uh, JDK scripting NASA module. This is one of the modules in uh, NASA. module hyphen info file. But this particular module says that my name is JDK scripting NASO. These, these modules, I require uh, Java logging module, I require JDK, Java scripting module, I require JDK dynamic module. These are the system different modules. I am going to use these modules in this uh, particular uh, module. Uh, it says that uh, if this particular module exports these packages, Exports JDK Nason API scripting, JDK Nason API tree packages. That means that this module says that only these packages are accessible outside this module. I mean, uh, another module, say com.acme.foo, cannot access any other package other than these two packages from this particular module. Okay? Everything else, for example, there is a, there is a package called JDK Nason internal. Uh, uh, runtime that package is not accessible outside of JDK scripting master module. Okay, and also it can say that I can specifically export these modules to some say friend modules. I mean, I exports JDK NASON internal runtime to this JDK scripting NASON shell module. You can you can choose to export few things. You 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 develop few modules together. You can say that you know these these uh, my friends. I export these these things to these modules. Specific exports you can say. And also, of course, also the provides tells you that you know this particular module provides a particular uh, service, the, the Java UT service 
uh, this provides the Java util service loader loader services. It says that I'm providing the service call script engine factory with this particular implementation class. You know, in the previous releases, you might have seen this meta info services uh, fire directory, meta info services directory, and the service meta info files. And that is replaced with this new provides uh, class. So you develop these particular info files and put it at the top level of your source code and use Java C to compile. Java C understands this new module info and then create artifacts that are need, needed for your application. That just gives you a brief overview of how to modularize your application. Once you start modularizing, then you will realize that, okay, uh, I'm, I'm exporting too much or I'm exporting too less based on my code base. I'll see, okay, I'm, I, this package is needed to be exported, then I go and add exports class. Uh, this is not this is not needed to be exported. This is an internal detail and go ahead and move that, do that uh, particular thing. Uh, to, to help you with that decision making, there is also a tool called JDEPS, which uh, 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 Deepu shortly demoed in his application. JDEPS tells you the dependencies of a given jar file. If you have a jar file that is that you are running in JDK 8, then you can say JDEPS, this jar file, that tells you the dependencies. This particular jar file requires these, 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 these things. You can use that dependencies as a guideline, and therefore you can say, okay, I need these, these modules, I export these, these things. So but you can use that as a first step to analyze your existing code and then modularize. Of course, once you modularize that, once you modularize the code, then you can uh, create a modular jar file out of that. Use that modular jar file as a starting module. Tell JLink, okay, take this as a starting module, not any of the system modules. Take this as a starting module and produce a reduced JR. JR. <coughs> and JLink will take that as an initial module, also called root module. From that root module, it will chase all the transitive dependencies and create uh, and create a reduced version of J JDK that is needed to run your particular application. Make sense? Yes, yes. Um, no questions. Um, so I had a question about the, uh, uh, especially uh, one of the uh, library about encryption, especially CDE. Usually uh, we have to download uh, um, um, a version, modified version from the Oracle uh, um, website to actually to replace some of the weak uh, encryption and correction that should be by default in the JK. Uh, with the JK9, they remove all of the stuff underneath uh, link and extend um, EXT uh, library. Uh, so, how can I use those things in Java? Right? Because if I download those jar, where should I put those jar into my JDK? Uh, uh, I couldn't quite get the question. I'll just rephrase and summarize and see if uh, that question closely uh, resembles what you're asking. Your question is about you are already using the extension jar file mechanism to 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 deploy a few things in your application. How do I do that? If that is removed in JDK nine, how do I? What is my alternative? Is that the question? Yes, especially the, the one with the uh, because there's some restriction about the US on law, so they can export the strong encryption and go them outside of US. Yeah, the unlimited key strength for that one. Um, and if I download the new file. Should I put those to use the stronger picture on yes. Okay. Uh, the, as I mentioned, this boot X boot class path and the extension jar mechanism are the two tricks by which you can you know override the platform provider classes uh, or augment to the platform provider classes. People used to use the dash X boot class path uh, and then prefix the boot class path or suffix the boot class path or use the dash D Java EXT does and supply a bunch of directories and so on. As I mentioned earlier, that is gone, but there is a replacement for that. Uh, that replacement is called XPatch. Uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a command line switch in the, GD, the new Java launcher called XPatch. And the XPatch, uh, sorry, that is going to change. Right? The, the XPatch option tells you uh, that these, these modules attached basically you're saying that oh, this smart particular module do not load it from the the lip modules but instead pick it up from here so you can say this expatch this module this particular directory this module this particular directory and so on so this gives you this this expatch gives you 
combined flexibility of the X boot class path option as well as the uh, ex extension directory mechanism. Essentially, what we are saying that use the X patch. X patch tells you that these these module code has to be loaded from elsewhere, not from the lib modules. But that will work for bootstrap modules as well as the uh, extension stuff. The extension stuff is now called platform class loader. This, it's no longer called extension loader. It's called platform class loader. So you can replace any module, not just the platform class loader modules, not just the bootstrap, even the application. For example, JDK Bin, so Java C itself is an application that uses its own module. Uh, if you have your own patched version of Java C for some reason and say that pick it up from this particular class directory, you can specify that. Some of these options are changing. They might, it's not stable yet, but there is a thought gone into this, uh, uh, this particular aspect and that people may want to override the platform classes for some reasons or augment the platform classes with their own new classes. Um, for that, there is an option. That option can be used. The patch option can be used. But if you're using, then you have to understand that you are on your own in the sense that uh, you have to be very careful with the security and uh, other aspects because you, you, are, you are replacing guts of certain platform classes with your own classes. Uh, and of course, JDK and Hotspot has had some assumptions about some of the classes. For example, if you try, uh, it will be an illuminating exercise if you try to modify Java Lang object and add a couple of fields. <laughs> Compile Java Lang object, adding a couple of fields, and try to run that, uh, and you'll see a fantastic crash. Because Hotspot thinks that there should not be any field in Java Lang object class. So yeah, so if you are replacing the classes of the platform, then you've got to be careful. It's up to you. Uh, but not all the classes. Usually, the Java dot base classes are the the danger zone. Everything else should be okay. So this is uh, this is for those people who are deploying in this non-trivial manner where they prefix or suffix the boot class path or, or the extension directory mechanism. Uh, practically, we do see that most applications uh, can run without these magic. Uh, but of course, some, some applications do need this kind of uh, you know black magic to, to start running. So that is one of the reasons why you might want to try the, the early access release and see, uh, see if uh, these options work for you. If it, if it doesn't work for you, then uh, uh, you should raise that as an issue, and pe people do is uh, raise that as an issue in the jigsaw hyphen uh, dev uh, alias and, and then bring up their issues like Apache and other 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 uh, people are uh, Red Hat, people from Red Hat Apache. Uh, uh, they are raising the these issues, uh, trying to run it on early access and say that you know this this particular option is not sufficient for us, uh, and you may want to raise that. In your particular case, if an X patch doesn't work for you. Uh, it's not sufficient for you. Uh, you may want to explain your use case and uh, raise that raise that issue uh, in, in, in Jigsaw Dev. Thank you. Did I answer that question? Yeah. Is there any more questions or you don't want? Yeah. Hello, uh, this is Darwin. I just want to understand. I'm seeing lots of documents on the internet comparing ISGI, the server to the early Apache actually, to the Jigsaw. So, can you give us an overview of what's the difference between the Jigsaw and the ISGI, like maintaining multiple versions of the class part and uh, the dynamic loading of different um, jars or modules, as you call it? So, yeah, just the overview, what functionality is replaced in the jigsaw it's already offered by the OSGI. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the uh, audio isn't quite clear. Can anyone uh, uh, replace, repeat the question to me here? Uh, you please help me uh, there, yeah. Sure. Um, the summary of the question was, um, uh, compared to um, OSGI, what's the um, what are the I guess the key differences? What are what gets replaced by um, what features that, that that overlap with Jigsaw and OSGI, and what uh, what uh, features does Jigsaw intend to um, replace uh, from Good. OSGI? All modules version. Good. Good. Including uh, how uh, modules are versioned. Are versioned. Uh. Oh, good question. So, uh, OSGA uh, as a module mechanism, you know that it uses the class loader tricks. It, it, it works on basically uh, filtering stuff using the class loader visibility and delegation aspect of the class loader. So, it's basic, OSGA is basically a, what, 
how do I put it? It's a hack on class loaders. Okay. So when I say hack on class loaders, uh, the compiler does not know anything about OSG unless you use your own modified version of Java C or anything. Uh, compiler itself does not does not know anything about your modules, and it cannot it cannot say, oh, okay, this module accesses things that it should not access, and therefore I should give an error message. It's, you are on your own. Okay. If you use that's not the case in Jigsaw modules. In Jigsaw modules. You have this module hyphen info dot Java for every module and the associated dot class file. And that means that Java C understands this. Java C knows that this is module and this module exports these packages and rest of the stuff is internal. Uh, and this is the service exported by this module and so on. So forth, which means that compiler can help you that compiler can tell you that, okay, you are accessing things that you're not supposed to access. And it's a compile, compile them error rather than uh, you figuring out that uh, the way you you deployed your modules is somehow wrong, and then uh, I'll have to go and edit some meta file, uh, add some exports and stuff like that. So it, it is a language mechanism. To the first uh, first and foremost difference is that it's language integrated, number one, and also that means that there's also a reflection API is updated. So you have the Java Lang reflect module, uh, Java uh, Java Lang uh, reflect module API, which means that you can. Curry the list of modules that you have, uh, which module exports to what, what packages are exported, what packages are con conceived uh, to the outside world, and so on and so forth. So the reflection API also understands about modules. So you can ask questions about uh, uh, queries about your module system uh, using reflection API. So, so the point is that it is integrated with the language, which means that it, the Java C and the uh, core libraries understand about the modules. Number one. Number two is that uh, there are, are there class loader gone? No, class loaders are still there. You, you, you still have the notion of class loader. You still have the notion of what we call layers. Layers is a bunch of modules uh, and a bunch of associated class loaders. You start with the layer called boot layer. In the boot layer, you have this bootstrap loader, platform loader, and the application launcher loader. So this is bootstrap layer. And you can add layers on top of the boot layer. So for example, if you want to have your own layer and you can uh, flexibly overwrite pieces of uh, the layer below your uh, layer. For example, on top of boot layer, you can add your own layer. Uh, in the layer, you can say, okay, these, these modules are overridden in this layer. Don't use this uh, underlying boot, boot layer code, introduce mine. So this gives you flexibility uh, to uh, much better flexibility compared to even the DAS override mechanism or any of those mechanisms of the past. So layers is also a reflective, uh, reflective API available as a reflective API, so you can query on layers and so on. So uh, I would say that you know, uh, as a language and tool integrated uh, mechanism, this is bound to be superior. It's not to, uh, it's not to. Uh, cast opinions on the pre-existing modules. They have the disadvantage that you know they have to work within the whatever is available mechanism in those days, which was class loaders. So you know they they, they they cannot go beyond that unless they want to you know change the compiler or some new compiler. So as a mechanism, this is uh, this is language integrated and therefore it can it can give you flexibility. And of course, it does give you. Uh, uh, some common cases, like if you use reflection API, uh, uh, it, you know, in, 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 the, in the earlier world, reflection API is unrestricted. You know, you can, if you can, if you can touch something, you can get everything, right? I mean, if something is public, it's public to the world, and that is something that is not true anymore. Meaning, if it is public, a class may be public, but it belongs to a package which is not a exposed package. So a module M can have a class which is a public class, but it is in a package called com.acme. Com.acme itself is not an exposed package. If you're not sitting inside the module, even though the class is public, you will not be able to access that. And not just that, even the reflection hack will not work. You know, in the in the in the earlier world, you have this set accessible true. You know, you got a method method object of the private method of the private class. You just say set accessible true. I know what I'm doing, and call it. Now, even reflection is encapsulated in the sense that even reflective root is prevented. If I try to do a set accessible true uh, on a non-exported package of a non-export class from a non-exported package, even if it's public, that will not flow through. Meaning, even, even the reflection hack is prevented 
so which is much better encapsulation in the sense that uh, the encapsulation is actually decoupled from many aspects for example uh, in, in, in the previous leases we used to use a mechanism for package dot access you know if you try to access things like sun dot uh, uh, miss dot unsafe from your code um, security if, if you run the application with the security manager you get a, a security exception for trying to access a you know sensitive package the list of packages are listed as sensitive packages in the uh, package dot access property and so on that is actually conflating two things. You have the security as one aspect, another one is encapsulation. Encapsulation, uh, sec security manager was doing double duty. It was doing encapsulate parts of encapsulation as well as doing security. That's not needed anymore. You can just make those packages as, as, as non-exported packages. That's it, that's all. And module, uh, uh, module access mechanism is there always, regardless of security manager. Whether or not you have a security manager, you will not be allowed to break in. Uh, Break the encapsulation and uh, go behind uh, using using the normal mode of execution, nor even the reflection. So I would say that that explains why this is superior compared to earlier systems. Um, it's getting a bit late, so I just wanted to say, if you wanted to to wrap up, Sundar, um, is there any key? Um, I guess first of all, is there any key um, resources? I know you've mentioned already the um, state of the module system, Mark Weinhold, um, Anywhere to get help? Um, where's where's the best place to um, get help uh, with um, using Jigsaw? And um, yeah, where, what else can people do between between now and when um, Java uh, nine is released? Okay. Yeah. 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 The, 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 apart from these, the earlier, earlier, please, you can also yeah. have a look at the the talk. There's one one this talk called Project Zigzag Under the Hood. That's a that's a very nice talk. So this and is just this is the Java YouTube channel. Is that is that what you're showing us? Yes, and that's the Java YouTube channel, and the Java Language Summit 2016 videos are posted already. Uh, so it's still happening. That, that conference is still happening. One more day, still pending. And they're posting all the talks. The one, the first talk, the, the project Jigsaw under the hood. Uh, this is a repeat talk in a sense, but uh, it's a very nice talk. You can go through that talk as well. And similar JVM Language Summit 2015 videos are also posted. Uh, you can search under the same Java channel. Uh, that talks uh, uh, that explains all the all the uh, salient features of Jigsaw project as well as uh, as I, uh, it, this one is under the hood talk. There were also a couple of other uh, developer talks given in Java one last year's Java one. So uh, I suggest you go through apart from going through this state of the knowledge system document, uh, you may want to go through the, 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 the Java 1 talks as well as JDMLS talks. For particular questions on, you know, my application doesn't run, my application cannot be run on JDK 9, uh, early access and so on, uh, you may want to write emails to jigsaw-dev. Jigsaw-dev is the open JDK alias, um, bringing bring in your issues on, on, on uh, you know, particular uh, application specific issues uh, uh, you know compatibility issues that you might find out uh, by running uh, an existing application in the uh, in the early access and if you find these, these things are broken then you know there's a lot of good discussions happen on this particular list and uh, all the jigsaw developers are on this list and people do respond to this list and this is where all the code changes also get reviewed so you know, for example, you see with automatic models, this, this thing is an ongoing talk, ongoing uh, thread that you can see uh, people finding these various issues and they report it. This person like Andrew Din, and he's from Hotspot, uh, he's from Red Hat. And, you know, all these people do discuss uh, various things. And uh, this list is a very highly informative list. So you can post uh, your, your uh, queries to that, uh, that OpenJDP list.